So I got to uh, visit my good friend Phil down in Stanford today, and even though I'm exhausted right now, I wanted to get some uh, thoughts out of my head, uh, out of my heart, of my mind, and my soul, uh, and share them. Um, I sat in on some of his, some of Phil's classes, a philosophy of science class, and uh, a class on being in time, Sein und Zeit, by Martin Heidegger. Um, the philosophy of science class was interesting. It was uh, a lecture on supervenience and um, the philosopher of uh, science, or the, the metaphysician, um, whose name who is David Lewis. Um, and, uh, and the idea here, uh, you know, I was not really that... Uh, excited about what was being talked about just because I uh, thought it was a poor starting point uh, in metaphysics where the final real things are uh, loci with, with qualities, with those qualities being like, uh, you know, vectors or spin or charm or just the, the qualities that physics attributes to the particles that, that they uh, statistically measure. And, you know, I would prefer something more like Whitehead's uh, actual occasions as the final real things. Um, an actual occasion is a drop of experience, whereas uh, for a physicist, a, a particle with qualities is uh, it's simply a thing. It's, uh, it's a happening which has no meaning, no presence to itself, uh, no enjoyment of itself. Uh, it's empty of experience and purposes and blind and deaf and dumb. You know, it's 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 a mere physical happening. Um, now, I don't think that Whitehead was any less an empiricist than, say, uh, David Hume, who uh, David Lewis is is sort of drawn from um, to defend what he calls uh, modal realism. But, uh, you know, if you can look up David Lewis if you want to know more about, about that. Um, but, you know, David Hume uh, is a famous empiricist, of course, and what Whitehead does to David Hume's empiricism um, is point out that, that what David Hume was uh, focusing on as his experience uh, as his sensory experience of the world was actually a high abstraction, something that only conscious linguistic human beings are capable of recognizing. Whitehead called this uh, perception in the mode of presentational immediacy, where the world appears to you as a series of bare universals, um, sensory atoms like redness or circularity, uh, and Whitehead wants to say that really the most primary form of experience is perception in the mode of causal efficacy, which is where we inherit the feelings of all of the entire universe and each of the bodies within it around us. Uh, and, you know, quite simply, the proof of causality is uh, the fact that we could feel anything at all. Uh, and, and through the, those feelings respond uh, at least organisms are able to uh, causally inherit the past of the universe all around them into their uh, organism as a feeling, as a, an intense uh, sense of, of purpose, right? Feelings are of uh, aversion or attraction, right? So there's a, a, a direction, a directionality to the feeling, and this, that this is causality for white men. Uh, it's the directionality of feelings, the values that feelings have. Um, you know, whereas, of course, um, while Hume was a empiricist, he was still, in the background, uh, taking the mechanistic picture of nature for granted. Um, and so, matter for him, the universe surrounding our organism, isn't pulsing with feeling, and uh, whatever I feel can't be said to be in any way connected to what might be out there. 
Uh, so Whitehead's radical in that he's saying, uh, unlike much of the modern uh, Western tradition, that nature is ensouled, and certainly before the modern tradition, uh, before the Enlightenment and uh, Descartes and Newton and Kant and uh, you know, Hume and others, uh, nature was ensouled. Um, you know, nature was endowed with uh, a certain intelligence that uh, was at work also in the human being. And there was a, a link between the two. Whereas you know, for modern philosophers, you know, Descartes and, and Hume especially, uh, and Kant, the, the human mind is no longer linked to nature, and nature has been drained of her, uh, of her life uh, and of her soul, and become a mere uh, collection of points to be measured based on various uh, numerical quantities uh, or uh, qualities of, of motion and momentum and uh, so forth. Um, so, you know, that class was, I guess, frustrating because I couldn't really get into it because of the faulty, what I perceived to be the faulty premises um, concerning what the actual real things are uh, at the base of reality. I say, with Whitehead, they're actual occasions, drops of experience. And uh, Hume sort of tacitly assumes uh, uh, a kind of um, atomistic reductionism, right? even if it's a reductionism, reductionism to sensory uh, qualia, uh, quali and, and not uh, you know, actual physical atoms, because you know, for Hume, those were beyond experience, so we didn't really know if they existed or not. Um, I don't think we can make sense of our own meaningful experience of being in the world if we're going to suppose uh, science has somehow determined that the fundamental things in nature are purposeless, uh, non-experiential, fundamentally non-experiential uh, atoms or particles of whatever kind. Um, and Fittingly enough, the next class that I sat in with uh, Phil in was a uh, class on Heidegger, uh, Heidegger's being in time, Sein und Zeit. And, uh, you know, in there we talked about being in the world and how for the human or for Dasein, uh, the world is always already full of meaningful projects for us. Uh, we're involved in it, and um, so many of our day-to-day -day actions are uh, habitual. Uh, we're thrown into the world and quickly become absorbed by the social uh, patterns and habits, and by the, the natural patterns and habits that uh, shape our lives on on this earth um, but, you know of course for Heidegger the, the human couldn't be without meaning and it wasn't just earth that gives us meaning uh, it wasn't just our own mortality that gives us meaning or being toward death it's also uh, the divine and uh, the sky that gives us meaning and you know in the sky, we can read uh, the cosmos, and in the divine, you know, certainly Heidegger uh, was a, uh, an avid uh, reader of Nietzsche, and I think an atheist in the sense that Nietzsche was, but Kierkegaard also, or uh, Heidegger also read a lot of Kierkegaard, and uh, had a sense of the presence of eternity and the calling of conscience, or, um, you know, perhaps we could say
is a spirit. And so was mm, at least a theologian in, in that sense. So, you know, Heidegger is complicated. And, uh, the fact that there's room in his, uh, his philosophy for the divine and for uh, the cosmos, for nature, which, which uh, you know, that's where uh, often, you know, people don't try to expand Heidegger's thoughts, uh, maybe even more than he would, he did in his, uh, in his own work. They don't uh, push meaning back into nature and recognize that, uh, you know, it's the human organism which has derived uh, its symbolic capacities, its meaning-making capacities from nature. It's not nature uh, which the human being has projected meaning onto. Uh, and I guess I'm going to wrap it up by uh, reading uh, an excerpt, at least, from Coleridge's uh, poem, The Aeolian Harp. Uh, Aeolius is a Greek god of wind. Oh, the one life within us and abroad, which meets all motion and becomes its soul, a light in sound, a sound like power in light, rhythm in all thought, and joyance everywhere. Methinks it should have been impossible not to love all things in a world so filled, where the breeze warbles and the mute still air is music slumbering on her instrument. And thus, my love, as on the midway slope of yonder hill I stretch my limbs at noon, whilst through my half-closed eyelids I behold the sunbeams dance like diamonds on the main, and tranquil muse upon tranquility, full many a thought uncalled and undetained, and many idle flitting fantasies traverse my indolent and passive brain, as wild and various as the random gales that swell and flutter on this subject loot. And what if all of animated nature be but organic harps diversely framed that tremble into thought as o'er them sweeps plastic and vast one intellectual breeze, at once the soul of each and God of all. It's pretty good, huh? Uh, yeah, thanks for li listening, and uh, I hope to hear back from uh, Phil about, about some of this and whatever else he had on his mind. Take it easy.